Hello, and welcome to the microbiology section of First Aid Express. My name is Rainy Wu, and I'll be your guide through this section. We'll start off with some general information about bacteria first, before diving into specific information about bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses, and finally, antimicrobial therapy. Bacteria are single-celled prokaryote organisms with several structural elements that distinguish them from eukaryotes. The table here lists these structural elements of bacteria and their functions. We will highlight how these structures vary between gram-positive and gram-negative organisms in the next fact. There are some key differences between the cell wall structures of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. Gram-positive organisms have thicker cell walls, composed of a high amount of peptidoglycan and lipotechoic acids, a combination of lipids and tecoic acids. These characteristics are useful in distinguishing bacterial serotypes, promoting bacterial interaction with human cell receptors, and initiating host immune responses. Gram-negative organisms contain much thinner peptidoglycan layers, outer membranes, and periplasmic spaces. The periplasmic space contains enzymes necessary for bacterial virulence, such as proteases, phosphatases, lipases, and beta-lactamases important inhibitors of penicillin drugs. Only gram-negatives contain lipopolysaccharide endotoxins within their outer membranes, which is a potent activator of host immune cells and causes macrophages to release TNF-alpha, which causes septic shock. This table classifies bacteria by structural and morphologic characteristics. It may be overwhelming now, but will make more sense to you as you become more familiar with the bacteria in this chapter. Refer to this table as you move through the chapter to help you keep the various bacteria straight. Two bacteria are important in mentioning because of the unique properties of their cell walls. Mycoplasma is a bacteria which does not have a cell wall. Mycobacterium, on the other hand, has a cell wall, but it contains mycolic acid in addition to polysaccharides, peptidoglycans, and lipids. These unusual cell wall properties pose challenges to gram staining and identifying mycoplasma and mycobacterium. In addition to mycoplasma and mycobacteria, there are several other bacteria that do not gram stain well. But first, what is a gram stain? It is an important staining technique that allows for differentiating bacterial strains based on the physical and chemical properties of their cell walls. The primary stain is crystal violet, CV dye, with subsequent application of iodine that complexes with the CV and becomes entrapped within the thick peptidoglycan cell walls of gram-positive organisms. Thus, gram-positive bacteria stain purple or blue. Decolorizer washes away unbound CV iodine complexes from gram-negative organisms that have thin peptidoglycan cell walls and could not effectively trap CV iodine complexes. Therefore, gram-negative bacteria lose their purple color. Finally, application of a counterstain, safranin, stains gram-negative bacteria pink. The organisms listed here are those that cannot be identified via gram stain, but can be differentiated using other techniques. We already mentioned mycobacterium and mycoplasma. Mycoplasma cannot be stained because it has no cell wall. Mycobacterium cannot be gram stained, but it can be stained with the acid fast method, which takes advantage of the high lipid cell wall content of mycobacterium. Mycobacterium will be bright red after staining with carbol fusion because its lipid rich cell wall prevents acid from washing out or decolorizing the stain. Treponema is too thin to be visualized, so one must use the dark field microscopy or fluorescent antibody staining to see it. Rickettsia, Legionella, and Chlamydia are intracellular parasites and difficult to see. Therefore, you must use immunofluorescent staining to visualize these organisms. Legionella can also be visualized by silver stain. You should associate these specific stains with certain organisms. For example, a Giemsa stain can be used to identify Borrelia, Plasmodium, Trypanosomes, and Chlamydia. The periodic acid shift stain can stain glycogen and mucopolysaccharides, making it useful in identifying the bacterium Trophaerimi whipellii, which is the cause of Whipple's disease. The Zeal-Nielsen stain is used to detect acid-fast organisms. 
Keep in mind that zeal nielsen is synonymous with acid fast. The India ink stain can stain for Cryptococcus neoformans. And lastly, the silver stain is useful to visualize fungi and Legionella. Here is an image showing how Cryptococcus neoformans would appear using the India ink stain. Bacterial culture is the process of growing bacteria on agar plates with medium and an additional nutrient source. It is another, albeit slower, method for identifying microorganisms. Media can be selective, meaning it contains antibiotics to prevent growth of contaminating microorganisms, such as the Thayer Martin or VPN media, which contains vancomycin, polymyxin, and nystatin to inhibit growth of organisms other than Neisseria gonorrhea. Media can also be differential, meaning it induces only the bacteria you are interested in to change color so that you can distinguish them from everything else. An example of this is McConkie's agar, which will only turn pink in the presence of lactose fermenting bugs, such as E. coli. Obligate aerobes are simply organisms that require oxygen in order to survive. As you can imagine, these organisms seek to infect areas such as the respiratory tract, where there is plenty of oxygen to be found. You can use this mnemonic to help you remember them. Nagging pest must breathe. Stands for Nocardia, Pseudomonas, Mycobacterium, and Bacillus. The opposite are organisms that survive only in the absence of oxygen. Put another way, these bacteria are incapable of growing in the presence of oxygen. This is because they lack the enzyme superoxide dismutase and or catalase which are important antioxidant neutralizing mechanisms against the toxic compound superoxide. Superoxide forms when organisms are exposed to oxygen, and without the enzyme superoxide dismutase, it cannot be converted into benign molecules that are safe to the bacteria. Catalase is an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. It is necessary when bacteria are exposed to oxygen to prevent the conversion of hydrogen peroxide into free radicals. Obligate anaerobes include Clostridium, Bacteroides, and Actinomyces. It is important to know if you are dealing with these bugs because they are resistant to aminoglycosides, since these drugs require oxygen in order to enter cells. Here are some bacteria which live within cells, some because they must in order to survive the obligate intracellular organisms, and others which can live within cells if they want to, but have mechanisms for surviving extracellularly if they have to. The facultative intracellular organisms. The obligate intracellular organisms are rickettsia and chlamydia. You can remember them with the mnemonic that they stay inside when it is really cold. The facultative intracellular ones are in this mnemonic. Some nasty bugs may live facultatively. This stands for the bacteria Salmonella, Neisseria, Brucella, Mycobacterium, Listeria, Francisella, Legionella, and Yersinia. These are simply bacteria which are covered by an outer capsule made of polysaccharides. These bacteria can be highly virulent because the capsule protects them from phagocytosis and T cell mediated immune responses. People who lack a spleen, anatomically or functionally, as in sickle cell disease, are highly susceptible to sepsis by encapsulated bacteria, as the spleen is an important barrier against these organisms. Asplenic patients should be sure to receive vaccination against these organisms. Those with B cell deficiencies are also at increased risk of disease by encapsulated bacteria, as B cell immunity is the main line of defense against these organisms. Use the mnemonic Shinskis to help you remember which are the encapsulated bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza type B, Neisseria meningitidis, Salmonella, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Group B strep. Some organisms contain catalase, an enzyme which degrades hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. You will learn more about chronic granulomatous disease. CGD in the biochemistry section, but just know that patients with CGD rely on hydrogen peroxide formation to fight off infections because hydrogen peroxide is an oxidative product that can kill bacteria. However, when CGD patients are infected by catalase positive species like staphylococci, these bacteria have the ability to break down hydrogen peroxide and prolong their survival. 
Organisms which are catalase positive include Staph aureus, Serratia, Pseudomonas, Actinomyces, Canada, and E. coli.